So I'd like to introduce to all of you Dr. Janet Defo. She received her PhD in psychology and completed her postdoctoral training at Stanford University. She worked as a staff psychologist at the Children's Health Council for 20 years. She now works as a clinical psychologist and is the proud mother of Whitney Defo. Thank you. So, in my old life, I was a child psychologist, and I'm a little bit like a CFS patient in that you look at me and I look normal, but in fact, I've had to give up most of my work because I'm taking care of an extremely ill, invalid son who uh, it, it takes a lot of care, is bedridden, and not only do I take care of him, but I talk to doctors a lot and email and try to figure out what medications to try and what to do. So I'm really isolated and I can't work very much anymore and I'm sure that any, anyone else here who's a caregiver of an invalid knows that this disease uh, <clears throat> affects more than just the patient. It's also their whole family, which is completely devastating. Um, so this is a picture of my beautiful son and daughter and this is a picture of what he was like um, before he was ill. Um, he was a talented um, photographer who did fine art photography and was winning awards and he ran an office for Obama in 2008 because he spoke Spanish and he was very politically active and energetic and he was really excited because he just started his own photography studio in a funky old house in Berkeley when he's a kind of a funky guy so he loved his funky old house in Berkeley and um, if you're ever in Andy's office he has lots of um, beautiful beautiful photographs um, that Whitney took hanging in his office um, and gradually Whitney started having symptoms and he would get dizzy a little bit in college and couldn't get up and take classes he actually failed one class because he couldn't get to class which was very unlike him and um, then he would get more and more tired and then it kind of went away and we didn't really know what was going on. He went to lots and lots of doctors and um, got all kinds of tests saying that everything was normal and the doctors said um, maybe you should try antidepressants and that really irritated him and us because he was not a depressed guy. He was very active, in love with the world, traveling, taking pictures of People, and if you want to look at his website, it's WhitneyDefoe.com, and it's got beautiful photographs of um, people in different walks of life and other things that he loved taking pictures of. To make money, he was a wedding photographer, and the brides voted him the most popular photographer in their company because <laughs> he was, he's just a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, and so then gradually he got more and more sick and didn't have energy and instead of doing his cool um, crazy without a recipe cooking for himself he had to go to Whole Foods and get frozen vegetables and I thought that's very weird and and then he couldn't clean up his dishes anymore and he couldn't do his laundry and so he had to move home and that was three and a half years ago and he didn't have enough energy to do the move so we moved him to our house and when he got there he could still interact with us. Gradually he got so that he'd have to leave and go lie down and he got so that he'd say, well, I'll be here but don't talk to me. Uh, two Christmases ago, or maybe three, he said, please tell everyone not to talk to me but I want to be with you. So he sat at our Christmas dinner uh, without any food on his plate and just was with us but he couldn't interact and after about an hour he went back in his room then he got so that he had to have a wheelchair and then he got really bad GI problems and gradually could eat less and less and we had to puree all his food for him and um, then he could only eat a very small number of things and gradually he couldn't eat at all and he's now on a pick line uh, which um, is delivers what's called TPN, Total Parental Nutrition, through a tube into just above his heart and he never eats and <clears throat> he really misses food <laughs> um, and that whole experience of eating. Uh, and now he's completely bedridden. Um, he can't barely move. He can't talk anymore. 
he can't tolerate anyone being in the room with him. Um, so, uh, was that the second picture? Go back, go back. Second picture. Second picture. That is a picture of him when he was actually pretty sick. My, my, uh, and I put it up there because it's a perfect example of how people can't tell that you're sick when you have CFS. My daughter was driving him to a doctor's appointment. He loves the ocean. He said, please stop by the ocean so I can just see the ocean. They got out of the car for five minutes and stood there and took that picture. And it tired him out so much that he had to lay in the back seat of the car and he couldn't get out of the car to get into the doctor's office when they got to the doctor. So, you know, if you see somebody like that, you're not thinking, oh my gosh, he's about to, you know, whatever. He looks great in that picture, right? And that was all the energy he had for that whole day. Um, okay, next. So this is um, a little while later where he got, I used to, to uh, wash his hair in the shower, leaning over him while he crouched on the floor, but he got so he couldn't get into the shower anymore, so I got this amazing blow-up wash your hair thing on the internet. And uh, But he can't tolerate that anymore, so I just buzz his head and he washes, he wipes it off, or I wipe it off with baby wipes, and th that's all we could do, and right now he can't tolerate me buzzing his head anymore. Okay. So this is Dr. Andy Kogelnik, who is Whitney's doctor, and we are blessed to have Andy, who comes to our home and emails us, and I send pictures, and he comes and treats Whitney and helps us. But before that, we really didn't have anybody, you know, until Whitney found Andy. Um, you, know, you can see, I mean, it's, it's a, he's a very wonderful, gentle, thoughtful doctor who does everything he can and you know it's really limited because we don't know what to do about this disease mostly. And this is a little bit later that's me and maybe my not favorite outfit but whatever. <laughs> um, this is how much weight he's lost. He's six foot three and he got down to um, 115 pounds which is probably what he weighs there. He, he can't walk anymore except to go to the bathroom every couple three days. Uh, and that picture, in that picture he was extremely distraught and anxious and I was trying to help calm him down. And there's, is that the last picture? That was the last picture. So, um, somebody suggested we try an osteopath for him. And, you know, we've tried a lot of alternative things. Acupuncture, which didn't really help. Ceremonies, Native American ceremonies. He does a Buddhist practice. Um, and we try to do the highest end Western medicine thing that we can, which is pretty pathetic since this hasn't been funded and people don't know what to do. But um, so it's another thing that happens to MECFS patients is that they spend all this money on all these different blogs. Something worked for some person, you try that. Doesn't work for you, you just keep trying things. Anyway, the osteopath asked him to please describe why it's so hard for him to tolerate people being in his room. Because now he's alone all the time. He can't, he's very neurosensitive. He can't deal with anybody in his room except when he just has to have like me changing his pick line or bringing him uh, clean things or clean towels or whatever, and that's very prescribed on a schedule. Otherwise, he's by himself all the day, and of course he misses his friends and human interaction. So she asked him to describe what it was like. But you know, I just need to back up one second. He, he was so bad that he couldn't communicate at all for a long time till about October 3rd and then he got this infection and some antibiotics and for some reason he got better a little bit and he could write cards to us. So I would spend from 12 to 4 at night back and forth with him writing these cards about you know what treatment could we try or please do this this way or, or just talking back and forth on these cards. He still couldn't talk, I couldn't talk to him. He couldn't text, he can't use the computer, but he was writing these cards to me and I saved all of them and they're all indexed by date. And then gradually he started getting worse again and we don't know why. Um, we don't know why he got better a little bit. Um, he was starting to text a little bit to some of his friends who were thrilled to hear him, but now he can't do that anymore. And he was really excited 
to be able to play with his iPhone a little bit and like look on the internet and order himself stuff. He ordered us a Christmas present. He ordered me a kneeling pad because I kneel by him his bed so often. He ordered me one of those things that gardeners use to, for my knees. Anyway, uh, so the osteopath asked him, what, can you please describe to me what it feels like when someone is in the room? Why does that feel so bad to you? And this is almost at the, this he wrote on January 18th, which was just about before he couldn't write cards anymore. He was saying, I'm getting worse. I can't write cards anymore. I'm terrified of going back into the abyss. And when she asked him to write this, this is what he wrote. Someone in room feels like wind is blowing through me, pulling me away like I'm made of sand and getting blown away like the Sandman in that Spider-Man movie. Draining, but it goes deeper than it should. There's no part of me that is safe from it. Or it feels like some superpower that pulls energy from a person and draws it to the other person, like there's this huge energy transfer from me to them. Only exception is if the person is in my room doing a routine task that I know well at the usual time and I know what's happening and I'm used to it and my condition can handle it, how bad CFS is at the time, like coming to change socks or to massage my stomach at the usual time. Then it's less draining. The worst is someone just hanging out in here, most draining. I think it's just because of how little energy I have when I'm alone, I can ration it and think slow, use less mental energy, and there's a social norm of meeting each other halfway. So when someone else is in here, I use a more normal amount of energy, like they are. Think faster, etc. But I don't know, just a guess. Headphones help me disconnect from them and that mental connection, and help, but still draining. But I just thought that that was so profound that he wrote that and he was barely functioning on other level and you know this is a person who's not depressed, who's very thoughtful, who's literate, who's you know really thinking about things and he's stuck in this body that doesn't work. So on January 21st he kept writing me cards. On January 21st his card said Things are going to get really bad now really fast. Need new treatment soon. I cannot handle getting worse and lying here in silence with just stress. Can't do it. And on January 22nd, he wrote, so much I need to say with a sad face. And then there were no more cards. So I'm telling you this so that you understand this is really a real disease and that we really, really need help funding to figure it out. Um, and I can tell you, after 45 years of being married to this brilliant man here, watching him solve problems that everybody said were not solvable over and over again, applying for grants that people would deny because they said that, that it was impossible and then he'd figure out a way to do it anyway and it would work every time, or 98% of the time. This is a guy who likes to solve problems that, uh, that are unsolvable, in quotes, who's done it his whole life. And I have no doubt with him and the amazing people he's choosing to help him um, that they'll be able to figure it out. But we have one huge impediment, which is funding. So we thank you very much for whatever you can do to help on that score. and for your understanding and enlightenment and sending the message to the world about this disease. Thank you very much.